All right, everyone. Uh, welcome to this year's first ACOM seminar. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Cody Jen, who's an assistant professor in chemical engineering, at Carnegie Mellon University, um, and also a member of the Center for Atmospheric Particle Studies. Just a little background on Dr. Jen. She got her um, bachelor's in chemical engineering at Columbia University and her master's and PhD in chemical and mechanical engineering at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. And she did her postdoc at the University of California at Berkeley. Her research and educational pursuits focus on understanding how the chemical composition and physical properties of atmospheric aerosol particles influence air quality and climate. Um, specifically, her goal is to disentangle the chemical complexity of the atmosphere by measuring and developing models to describe the different compounds and reactions that help form and grow atmospheric particles. Um, these models will help predict how human activities will alter air quality over the coming decades. Her group also specializes in building aerosol instrumentation to measure physical characteristics and the makeup of aerosol particles um, produced from wildfires and um, complex atmospheric reactions. And today she's gonna talk about sulfuric acid driven new particle formulation formation in the atmosphere. So Dr. Cody Jen, take it away. Thanks Nick for the introduction. Um, I really appreciate it. I didn't know that I was the first seminar for this year. Um, I guess it's pretty early in the year, so that makes sense. So as Nick mentioned, I'm an assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon in the Center for Atmospheric Particle Studies in the Department of Chemical Engineering. I've been at CMU for what seems like the whole pandemic plus a few years, but we like to call ourselves the pandemic professors now. Um, so I wanted today to talk about sulfuric acid driven nucleation, which is something that I've been working on ever since my PhD. And I purposely picked this topic because um, it must have been almost 10 years ago. I spent, uh, I think, more than a month, maybe two months at NCAR um, working with uh, June Smith, June Zhao, and Fred Isley already retired then. Um, working with them doing some of these uh, instrumentation development and measurements. And so I figured this is a nice way to bring this topic back home to kind of where, when I started my PhD. And so this work, um, looking at new particle formation has been primarily done by two of my more senior students in my group, Sandra Fomente and Jack Johnson. Sandra's about to graduate um, and Jack um, still has another year or so left. Um, this work has been funded, is funded by NSF and DOE. And a lot of it's funded both on looking at the chemical reactions behind nucleation and instrumentation development. And Sandra has been funded by the CMU Presidential Fellowship. So just for all on the same page, I'm going to go through kind of a, a quick overview on nucleation, so why is sulfuric acid important, and then talk about all the neat results coming out of our lab. Hopefully it lets me advance. There we go. So just, just, so, we're, just so we all know, Atmospheric aerosols are important, um, not only the gas phase, but the particle phase. And this is an image I have uh, borrowed from Jasper Kirkby from Cloud. And he did a really excellent job summarizing all the different sources and processes of uh, atmospheric aerosol particles. So you, we get a lot of primary emissions. We get some from sea salt or mineral dust or biomass burning. But we also get a lot of gases that come up from various types of human and natural sources. Like we get DMS or dimethyl sulfide from oceans, which then can oxidize into SO2. Or we get a lot of biogenic organic vapors from trees or some hydrocarbons or other weird looking exotic um, organic compounds from factories or from automobiles. And these gas-based compounds can react and form particles. And this, as we know, is called the secondary aerosol formation pathways. And so nucleation falls under the secondary pathway where we have particles that weren't originally emitted as a particle are being formed from these gas phase components. And so these particles, regardless if they come from secondary pathway or from a primary pathway, grow up and then become cloud condensation nuclei. These are seed particles for clouds to, uh, for water to condense and form cloud droplets. And the more CCN there are, typically you see uh, clouds that are brighter, um, whiter, and reflect more sunlight um, away from the planet. So more aerosol particles in the atmosphere lead to increased cloud albedos and typically their lifetimes. And so the reason why we care so much about how these aerosols are produced is it directly relates to how much radiation is making into the planet. 
And there's a lot of ways, as you see on the right here, there's a lot of ways aerosol particles are removed from the system, but I'm not going to focus any part of the talk, uh, my talk on that, but there are many, many um, interesting pathways that they can be removed. And so um, I like to think of the life cycle of a secondary particle straight up from these, uh, we call them like nucleation or banana plots. And so for those of you not familiar with these graphs, on the x-axis, we have time of day. So we go from 8 a.m. to midnight. And this particular location, we were at the DOE site in Southern Great Plains in Oklahoma, and this was taken in 2013. And on the y-axis, we have the particle mobility diameter, or how big is the particle. And so we go from about 2 nanometers all the way about to 200 nanometers. And the intensity scale here, so the redder it is, indicates a higher concentration of particles. So you don't need to know the exact numbers, but just know sometime around 9, 10-ish AM, you get this sudden burst of very, very tiny particles at a high concentration. So they're small. They're like, again, two nanometers. And there's a lot of them. And this occurs when the sun is um, coming up. You get a mixture of pollution that from people driving to work during rush hour, or you get the temperatures increasing, driving some gas-based compounds off of the ground. And these form particles. They nucleate and form about one to two nanometer particles. And then after that point, they start to grow into what we say CCN sizes. So this again is a classic nucleation banana plot because I guess it kind of looks like banana. Um, we kind of think of all different foods for these kinds of uh, graphs, like for the tomatoes and things like that too. But this is a classic banana plot. And so again, we see here, we just before, um, you see the burst of new particles, we just have a whole bunch of gas-based components. They're about one angstrom in diameter. And then once they hit and condense or nucleate or react, they start to form these stable one to two nanometer particles. And then they grow larger to about 50 to 100 nanometer particles. And then it's at this point, they can serve as CCN or seed particles for cloud droplet formation. And so we like to break up the life cycle of the secondary aerosol particle into three stages, nucleation, growth, which is the catch all of it growing bigger, and then activation into a cloud droplet. And so nucleation is primarily what this talk is going to be about. And the reason why we care so much about nucleation is it drives a lot of the, the production of global cloud condensation nuclei. And so this is a graph from Hamish Gordon's paper in 2017 in JGR. And as you can tell, you have an outline of all the different continents. And the colors represent the fraction of seed particles that are from nucleation. And this is a model simulation. And the simulation only accounts for um, nucleation processes from sulfuric acid. But the red redder areas indicate almost all the seed particles um, for cloud formation comes from nucleation. So red is primarily near the, um, in the Arctic Ocean, in Northern Canada and Northern Russia, around the Antarctic Circle. And then you see a lot of blue regions. And these blue regions typically correspond to where there's high primary emissions. And so here in, um, in China and in India and in Taiwan and Japan and Southeast Asia, off the coast of Western Africa and in the uh, Southern Oceans, you get a lot of primary emissions. These here are from uh, human activities. These are human activities, but mostly biomass burning. And the Southern Ocean is mostly sea spray um, aerosol particles. But if you take the average over the entire world, um, about 50% of the total cloud condensation nuclei comes from nucleation. And again, this was a pretty simple nucleation model in, in, in this uh, simulation. If we add more types of pathways for nucleation, these numbers could change. But clearly, this is an important pathway for aerosol production and for formation of seed particles for clouds. And so when I first started looking at nucleation um, for my PhD, uh, we knew that it was primarily driven by sulfuric acid. And so here's a paper from Modi Chen's paper from PNAS in 2012, where on the y-axis, um, he plotted the nucleation rate. So this is the formation rate of one nanometer particles the concentration of one nanometer particles every second. And so this is telling you how quickly these particles are being formed. And on the x-axis, we have the concentration of sulfuric acid measured in the environment. And each of these colors represents a different location around the world. We get very, very polluted places like Mexico City in red. And this kind of turquoise color here is Atlanta. 
And then you see Boulder here is in this brown color. Um, so not, not super, super polluted, not super, super clean either. And then you get like what we consider more clean conditions like Futila Forest in Finland. Um, and then Macquarie Island still has a full source. So this is, you know, a, a handful of locations. And we see that there's a clear relationship between how quickly particles are formed or the nucleation rate and the sulfuric acid concentration. The more sulfuric acid concentration there is, the more particles you're producing and at a faster rate. And so we knew about this relationship and we, we, we hypothesized that sulfuric acid must be the key component driving nucleation in these locations. And so a, a lot of folks were looking at, can sulfuric acid nucleate by itself? Can a sulfuric acid molecule collide with another sulfuric acid molecule, reduce the, the you know, try to reduce the surface area and, and uh, minimize the free energy to form a particle? And this was all captured in the classical nucleation theory um, or Calvin effect or droplet um, theory, whichever has many different names. And when we just look at sulfuric acid, and in this case, we looked at sulfuric and acid and water nucleating, we get these dotted lines. We called it binary sulfuric acid water um, nucleation theory. So this predicts that a nucleation rate of let's say 10 to the zero, which is one, would need about you know, two to three times 10 to the nine sulfuric acid concentration. Whereas in the atmosphere, we are observing that at orders of magnitude lower sulfuric acid concentration. So the question is, why does classical nucleation theory predict nucleation rates that are so much lower um, than what we're observing in the atmosphere? And there's a couple of reasons for this, and these are all pretty well known. Um, First and foremost is classical theory fails because you're taking a bulk property like a vapor pressure or it's taking a surface area at surface energy and you're extrapolating it down to one nanometer. Um, one nanometer is like a couple of molecules just hanging out. Um, how do you describe a couple of molecules hanging out having a vapor pressure or having a surface? It's, it's, it's a little strange down in that size range. And also because in that size range, there's a lot of quantum mechanical effects. Like you get a proton transfer, you can get hydrogen bonding, so on and so forth. And another problem with classical theory, and this is probably the biggest one, is we don't actually know the composition of these little particles at one nanometer. They're not all sulfuric acid. They're not all sulfuric acid and water. They probably have other junk attached to it. And classical theory assumes all these clusters of the same size are composed of the same number of molecules and the same composition. And so clearly, this is not quite the theory that's going to let us predict nucleation rates accurately in the atmosphere. And so a new model was developed, and it's new in that you know it just follows chemical um, kinetics. And I come from a chemical engineering background, and I've taught um, chemical reaction engineering for like six semesters now. Um, and so the Kennett reaction model is just following how molecules collide, stick together, and re-evaporate. And so it's a very simple model, and we, we use cluster balance equations to describe this. We start with a monomer, and let's just say the monomer is a sulfuric acid molecule for now. We have a monomer, it collides at the collision rate, at the gas collision rate, um, with another monomer, and forms a dimer. So you see a dimer here, two sulfuric acid molecules loosely clustered together. And this dimer could either re-evaporate back into two monomers at an evaporation rate of E2, or it could collide with a monomer and grow into a triangle, and so on and so forth. So we have all of these collisions going forward and all these backward evaporation rates. And so I can pick one size bin. I could pick the dimer. Yeah, I picked the dimer. Um, and I can write down how the concentration of the dimer will change with time. If I put in 100 molecules in a box, I can model how the concentration of the dimer will change. And this is what's known as the cluster bounce um, equations and or birth death equations is another term. You get the formation rate of the dimer. So it can be formed from monomers colliding with another monomer. It could also be formed by a trimer evaporating back into a dimer. In this case, since the size is so small, there's actually no other formation pathways. It can be destroyed um, in many different ways. It could evaporate, um, and it can coagulate with any of these larger sizes. Um, so kappa is a coagulation rate of it being lost to other, other sizes, or it can get lost to walls. So if this reaction is taking place in a box or in a chamber, it can also be lost to walls. So you get a simple formation rate, 
and you get a simple destruction rate. And so if you can measure how much A2 there is or how much monomer, trimer, tetramer, so on and so forth, and if you knew um, the parameters of how quickly something's lost to the walls, really you're just kind of left with these evaporation rates. So again, this is, these are some big assumptions. If I told you I can measure the concentrations of all these clusters, and I knew kappa and I knew eta, which are the loss rates to coagulation and wall loss, all I would need to know to model how quickly a particle is forming are the evaporation rates for each of these sizes. And these evaporation rates are highly dependent on what the cluster is made out of. If it's three sulfuric acids or if it's two sulfuric acids and like a malonic acid, so on and so forth. So trying to understand these evaporation rates is requiring us to take all these detailed cluster measurements. And so we know out in the atmosphere, it's not just sulfuric acid. We know sulfuric acid must be reacting with something else to help lower these evaporation rates in order to even form particles. And we got the first, there's been, I'm only gonna highlight one study here because yeah, I kind of like this study. Um, but there's many other studies that have been showing this around the same time period that were showing that there's definitely other compounds out there in helping with nucleation. I'm not sure what happened in the title there. Um, so this study was done by Rodney Weber um, and Pete McMurray and must have been mid 1990s. And they're in the Macquarie Islands, so off the coast of Australia. And they were taking particle measurements. So they're looking at the concentration of three to four nanometer particles. And they were kind of sailing around. They were going around the island and they were seeing that when they were downwind of Macquarie Island, they saw many, many more three to four nanometer particles. When they were upwind of the island, be it north or south, depending on which way the wind direction was going, they saw almost no tiny particles. So there was some correlation with emissions coming from Macquarie Island that was leading to a burst of uh, tiny particles being formed, in addition to sulfuric acid being around. And so it turns out Macquarie Island is a really popular hangout spot for penguins. And they believed at the time that it was these penguins and penguin emissions, um, which if anyone's gone bird watching, smell awful. Um, they, were, they believed that it was the penguin emissions that were helping sulfuric acid nucleate to form all these particles. And the reason why penguin emission smells bad is because it has a lot of ammonia and a lot of really weird amines coming off of uh, 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 their excrement, basically. And so there was a push after this, after the study, to try to measure ammonia, try to measure some of these amines to see how they're reducing the evaporation rates in those cluster balance equations. And so this is about the time I entered the scene, uh, not 1990s, uh, later in the 2000s, was to try to measure how sulfuric acid is nucleating with these other compounds to form stable particles. So again, we're going from one angstrom in size to one nanometer size. It's not a big, these are still very, very tiny particles. And because they're really tiny particles, trying to measure these, these reactions is incredibly difficult. So we have a clear goal. We want to measure these nucleation reactions. The problem is we were severely limited by instrumentation. And this was what the partnership with uh, Pete McMurray and um, a lot of researchers at NCAR, like Fred Isley and, and Jim Smith and Dave Hansen were um, helping to help solve, you know, trying to come up with the instruments of doing this. We first need an instrument, and that should be a key, um, we first need an instrument that can measure at extremely low concentrations. We're talking like 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 8 number per cc. Very, very low concentrations. And we also need an instrument that was able to measure a newly formed cluster or particle. Again, if you look at the diagram down here, a one nanometer particle is held together by pretty loose intermolecular um, forces. And clusters that are just loosely held together tend to break apart when you measure them. It's like when you poke something with a stick and it's going to fall apart. So we need an instrument that was extremely sensitive and did not impart that much energy onto the clusters. And so this is where um, Fred Isley worked really hard on de uh, developing what he called the cluster SIPs. And there's many iterations of the cluster SIPs now. Um, and there's been quite a few uh, chemicalization, atmospheric pressure um, aspects that have come from this. And so the original one from um, Fred Isley had a different looking inlet than this, but this is more like the second generation um, inlet. 
but he relied on nitrate as the chemicalization agent. So HNO3 dot NO3 minus. And again, it's at atmospheric pressure. So you get this um, ion kind of holding together with its, its ligand. Um, if this were at reduced pressure, this ligand would not, this HNO3 would not be here. And so you would get this chemicalization reagent ion would collide with the sulfuric acid cluster. Here I show a dimer, um, H2SO4 dimer, and it could have something else attached to it, like an ammonia molecule or a water molecule. And when it chemically ionizes, the sulfuric acid gives the nitric acid a proton or nitrate a proton, and it forms a charged sulfuric acid dimer. And typically during this process, this X, whatever the X was, will pop off. We don't know if it pops off during the actual ionization process or if it pops off during the measurement of the cluster going into the vacuum system. We, we cannot distinguish that. But we see is a charged sulfuric acid dimer. And so here's what the inlet looks like in a cartoon schematic. We have nitric acid that passes over a radioactive source to make nitrate ions. And these nitrate ions will react with whatever sulfuric acid clusters are in the sample flow. And then we use an electric field to drive it into the um, inlet or into the orifice of the mass spec. The original cluster SIMS, which I believe is still hanging out in NCAR, um, is huge, needs like forklift to lift it, um, is, is a quadrupole based one. Um, the newer ones are top based ones to get even lower, uh, get even higher sensitivity and even higher resolution. And so what was so nice about this design that um, Fred Isley made for the cluster SIMS is it had a very controllable ionization region. I could control how long nitrate spent inside of this electric field by dialing, changing the electric field, and how long it would have to ionize the, the um, sulfuric acid vapors and clusters. It also, the, it, the mass spec was specifically tuned to have very, very low cluster fragmentation. So we knew at the time, if we didn't break up the nitric dimer here, um, that a lot of our sulfuric acid clusters would also not break up when they were inside the mass spec. And so low fragmentation, very controllable ionization region, in addition to high sensitivity, allow the cluster sims to go out and measure all these concentrations of clusters out in the atmosphere. In addition, on, on the Pete McMurray side, um, and kind of really spawned a lot of, lot of um, development in these one nanometer particle measurements, but we were also um, looking at trying to develop um, ways to better measure one nanometer particle size and concentration. And so this was first originally thought of by Ken Ida, uh, Kenjiro Ida and Pete McMurray's lab. And there's been many, many new instruments that still use diethylene glycol. But you, you get um, kind of the same SNPS type um, setup where you have your aerosol going through a, some kind of ionizer and then it gets size selected through a mobility sizer, so differential mobility sizer. And then it goes through a diethylene glycol condensation particle powder. So you typically go through a hot DG saturator and then a cold condenser. And this grows particles to maybe of maybe 100 nanometers. And then you have a butanol CPC to grow it even larger to count it with, um, uh, to optically count it. And so this original uh, DEG SMPS um, could measure particle concentrations down to one nanometer, which is about 1.3 nanometers mobility diameter. But of course, it just counts particles. It doesn't give you any composition or chemical information. So we need both these instruments to tell us the full story of what's happening with the nucleation. Um, both instruments are not perfect. Uh, the DEG SMPS is very, very uncertain in both how it charges particles in one nanometer and how we get diethylene glycol to condense on it. The mass spectrometer, the SIMS, or the cluster SIMS is really, really uncertain when we talk about chemicalization and fragmentation and just general, how do you convert it over to a concentration? So no technique is perfect, but this was still better, better than not measuring anything. And so, um, I was working in Dave Hansen's lab for many, many years. Uh, and I was, um, Dave built this excellent flow reactor. And it's very similar to the flow reactors that were being used um, when he was at NCAR. And so this is a sulfuric acid flow reactor. And the top, we are flowing uh, sulfuric acid at a pretty high concentration, probably about 10 to the nine, 10 to the eight, 10 to the nine. And we also introduced nitrogen and humidified flow at the top. And it traveled down the length of the reactor that was about 1.2 meters long. 
And at the very bottom is where we mounted all of our instruments. What makes this reactor unique is it was constantly purged with um, sulfuric acid vapor. At the time of these experiments, it was already purging for about two years. Um, I think Dave's now been purging it for like 10 years. <laughs> and each subsequent year, it just gets cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. Um, and operating these reactors is not, not trivial um, because just keeping anything clean so you can measure reactions taking place at 10 to the 5, 10 to the 4 number per cc, that's like way below contamination level. So it takes, it's definitely an art form trying to run these reactors without any form of contamination. And my students can definitely attest to how difficult that is. So like I said, we've mounted our cluster sims to the bottom. And here's the same schematic of the transverse ion inlet that um, I was talking about in the previous slide. And some bit above it, we mounted our DEG SMPS. And then we would inject a base compound like ammonia or means into the flow reactor and then measure the resulting particles and then measure the resulting um, gas phase and cluster concentrations with the mass spec. And so we had a roughly a three second nucleation time from when we injected the base reacting with sulfuric acid going down. So three seconds isn't that long, but certainly long enough to capture things, uh, compounds that are nucleating um, and reducing evaporation rates to about 10 to the minus one um, inverse seconds. And so this again is the general setup. We, we focused first on emissions that we thought were impeguid emissions. So we looked at ammonia, we looked at methylamine, dimethylamine, and trimethylamine. And here's kind of like the ball and stick models from them. They smell awful. Uh, definitely don't. They're very sticky compounds. They're quite difficult to actually work with. And we injected them into the flow reactor at parts per trillion level, or about 10 to the 7 number per cc. And we measured first the sulfuric acid monomer concentration. And you see that down here in the x-axis. And then on the y-axis, we measured the sulfuric acid dimer concentration. So if the compound has no impact on nucleation, you would imagine that the sulfuric acid dimer concentration will not increase or not change as you add, in this case, ammonia into the flow tube, right? If it doesn't react, it should do nothing. What you see here, when we inject 100 parts per trillion of ammonia to the green dots, which is 300, all the way to 6,000 parts per trillion, we see as we increase the base concentration, we get an increase in the dimer concentration. So ammonia must be helping form sulfuric acid dimers. To what extent it's helping, that totally depends on how much it's reducing the evaporation rate. In this case, it doesn't seem to reduce it as much as some of the amines. So we repeated these experiments for methylamine, dimethylamine, and trimethylamine. And we get the same x-axis of the measured sulfuric acid concentration. And the y-axis is also the sulfuric acid dimer concentration. And each of these bases are, is interacting with sulfuric acid to form stable dimers. All of them do that. All of them are helping um, nucleation occur. But they seem to help it at different concentration levels. So at like three parts per trillion of uh, dimethylamine is about equal to like 300 parts per trillion of ammonia in producing that same effect. And with methylamine, you need 20-ish parts per trillion to get that same effect. And so based just solely on how much base you need to increase the dimer concentration, we concluded that ammonia, not great at, at uh, enhancing nucleation rates. And methylamine comes in as a you know strong second. Uh, third, I guess. And then trimethylamine and dimethylamine, based on the results, were actually kind of similar. Um, they're both very good at enhancing nucleation rates, which also means decreasing those evaporation rates of clusters, sulfuric acid clusters. So this was a super neat study. And the next study was, OK, there's other junk in penguin emissions uh, that also smells bad. And we wanted to look at diamines. These are, as we kind of hypothesized at the time, well, it has two amino groups, and two amino groups means it can proton transfer twice with sulfuric acid, so it should, in theory, make a ton more particles um, with sulfuric acid. We looked at ethylene diamine, tetramethyl ethylene diamine. This one kind of doesn't follow the pattern only because I just happened to find it in the chemistry stock room, but butane diamine and pentane diamine, and I like to call them by their more uh, fun names like putrescine and cadaverine. 
But basically, these are um, alkyl diamines. So you get the, like the long chain with the two amine groups on the end. So we injected this, but instead of using a mass spectrometer to measure clusters, um, we actually were running into a problem. It formed uh, clusters that were so big, our mass spectrometer could not see it uh, as well. Um, so we actually used the diethylene glycol or DGS and PS to measure the total particle concentrations that were coming off. And so on the X axis here, we measure the base concentration of the diamine that was going in. We go from a little bit less than one part per trillion all the way to like a thousand parts per trillion. Um, this was a nightmare operating at a thousand parts per trillion. You almost always contaminate the flow tube then. And each of these different colors represents a different um, base. And so we held the sulfuric acid concentration constant, and then we just injected different bases at different concentrations. So these orange triangles here represent methylamine, which we saw before. And you know, it's, it's not a bad nucleator, it's an okay nucleator. At low concentrations, it forms some particles, and then at higher concentrations, it forms more particles, which is what we expect. But then we did dimethylamine, and we see, okay, at lower concentrations of dimethylamine, we see more particles being formed. That totally agrees with what our mass spectrometer saw. But then we also looked at three diamines, EDA, Tamida, and putrescine. And you see these at low concentrations form even more particles than dimethylamine. This tells us one, that dimethylamine and sulfuric acid clusters still evaporate. And two, that diamines must be really, really good at nucleating. It takes almost, it takes like almost no diamine in the atmosphere to form a particle. And so we were in um, SGP in Oklahoma in 2013. And we were measuring how, like, how much putrescine, how much cadaverine is there actually hanging out in SGP. For anyone who's been to SGP, it's like a cow farm. Um, lots of cows roaming around the trailer. One of them kicked over, um, escaped, and then kicked over uh, one of our pump housings. Um, so a lot of cows around there. A lot of uh, petroleum um, wells as well. And so in this top graph, we have the diamine concentrations. And this was measured by Dave Hansen. And then red, we have putrescine, and blue, we have cadaverine. So one monoamine and two diamines. And then in the bottom graph, we have the sulfuric acid concentrations. Each of these lines represents a nucleation event. So we saw a whole bunch of little particles form. So obviously, when sulfuric acid spiked is when a nucleation event happened. But sometimes it would a nucleation event happened when cadaverine was high, or putrescine was high, or dimethylamine was high. Like here, putrescine was high, but dimethylamine, not so high. So maybe putrescine had a much bigger role in nucleation that day than dimethylamine did. So it's hard to say what actual reactions were happening in the atmosphere, but we're pretty sure all of these compounds we are monitoring helped at some point. No. So how do, we, how do we tell the difference? How do we know if monoamines are important? How do we know if diamines are important? How do we put any of this into one of those climate models and say, okay, this nucleation reaction is actually important? And so, more complicated, I graduated. Um, and then the picture just got more and more complicated as I was postdocing and do wildfire research. So many groups came up with so many other compounds. Um, and my group just recently, uh, we have a paper under review right now looking at um, alcoholamines so monoethanolamine, diethanolamine, triethanolamine. Um, MEA is commonly used for CO2 sequestration, and triethylamine is found in hand sanitizers, which we're all super familiar with. Um, it leaves that like really kind of slimy feel on your, on your hands. And so we did similar measurements as we did before, where we get more, part of, more sulfuric acid dimer concentrations with more MEA injected into the tube. And so we did this for these three compounds. And we see, oh man, there's a whole new set of of amines out there that can also nucleate with sulfuric acid. So it's not just alkyl amines, it's not monoamines, it's not just diamines, it's now alcohol amines. And suddenly this list is starting to get bigger. And then around the same time, um, there's been some studies showing, well, it's not just single amines that can do it. If you have a mixture of compounds, they can synergistically react with sulfuric acid. So this is from um, Walker Glasso's paper from Dave Hansen's group, where they measured total co particle concentration on the y-axis and DMA methylamine concentration on the x-axis. So here, um, Walker just injected methylamine. 
And obviously you get more particles as you inject more methylamine into the sulfuric acid reactor. Here's where you add methylamine and ammonia. So that seems to be like very high because remember ammonia is not great at forming particles, but you put a little bit of ammonia in and gosh, it forms a ton more particles. I could just put DMA into the flow reactor and I get obviously more particles than I get with methylamine. But then when I put ammonia in, I get even more particles. Again, ammonia, not great at forming particles, but somehow combinations of an amine and ammonia synergistically react to form, synergistically react with sulfuric acid to form more particles. So this picture is getting more and more complicated. Before it was just like, okay, we know sulfuric acid is reacting with ammonia or reacting with methylamine or reacting with one, one other compound and it's forming a particle. Now it's not, it's not just one compound. It could be any number of compounds in this complex soup of the atmosphere that could be reacting. And it's not just any compound, it could be any combination of compounds that could synergistically react with sulfuric acid to form particles. So if you talk to a modeler um, and you tell them, hey, I need you to put at least 100 reactions in to your model to predict nucleation rates, they're gonna laugh at you. <coughs> the modeler I know certainly laughed at me. Um, it's just not possible. And if you ask an experimentalist to go and measure every single reaction that could possibly nucleate, will probably not laugh, we will probably just cringe in fear actually. And so kind of the summary of all the slides I showed before is it, there's so many compounds out there that can nucleate with sulfuric acid. Um, it seems like every, every paper I review is like a new compound that can nucleate with sulfuric acid. We know the basics, we know water and amines help, we know ammonia helps. But what I did talk about is amino acids, amides, oxidized organics, ions. We don't know what composition the ions are. We know organic acids can help. We know inorganic acids can help. I mean, the list just goes on. Um, and if you start varying the temperature and relative humidity, you can get even more compounds to nucleate. So how do we, how do we package all of this information into a usable nucleation model um, that can go on and predict nucleation rates? And so this is what my group has been trying to figure out um, since then. Um, two, two reasons. One, we actually want models to accurately predict nucleation rates all around the world. And two, mass spectrometers are really good at breaking. And we were hoping, is there a way that we could develop a model and an instrument that lets us measure nucleation in complex chemical environments? And so just to give you a quick overview on nucleation, there, right now there's like two types of models. Um, the first one, um, which a lot of folks use uh, um, in, their, in their aerosol microphysics model, are parameterized models. So if I go into the lab, and this is from Katriana's paper in 2018, if I go to the lab, I can measure nucleation rates. In this case, it's 1.7 nanometer, um, formation of 1.7 nanometer particles. And I can kind of relate it to some concentration. In this case, it's concentration of sulfuric acid squared times ammonia times um, oxidized um, organic molecules. But it's some proxy of concentration. I could fit a line to my data and I could come up from this line some parameterized or some fitted relationship that if I measure the sulfuric acid concentration and I measure the ammonia concentration and I measure the HOMS or oxidized organic molecule concentrations, I could predict nucleation rates. So this is great. These are very simple equations, very easy to implement into a model. Um, the downside is, again, you will have to do run the experiments for every combination of molecules out there if you want to have a parameterized fit model that describes what's happening in some region of the world to predict nucleation rates. Another downside is you will still have to go to every location on the planet that you think this nucleation reaction is important and you will have to measure sulfuric acid concentration, you will have to measure ammonia concentrations, and you will have to measure HOMS concentrations. And there's something equivalent for ammonia and dimethylamine synergistic reactions. Um, you get something equivalent for just sulfuric acid and an amine. You can get all these power law um, uh, models. And there are many of these power law models, but we don't have the measurements of all these precursor gases. And we don't know how multiple of these parameterized uh, models fit together in one region. 
if you have more than just ammonia and humps, what if you also have an amine hanging around in the area? How does this power law relationship change? So again, this is a really simple model. It's really great to implement. And it captures, it definitely captures quite accurately nucleation rates based on these precursors. But the logistical challenge of getting it to work all around the world and taking the measurements is not trivial. Then other reaction, the other nucleation model is what I was talking about before. It's called the acid-based chemical reaction model. And you get the same forward reactions and backward reactions. And you could write the same cluster dynamic or birth death equations that um, I showed before, where you can not model the explicit concentration of every size of particle that's being formed and destroyed. And you can run the simulation at some steady state or at some set amount of reaction time. And you can calculate the nucleation rate or the formation rate of some certain size. And so this has been done both experimentally and through computational chemistry. And it works, obviously. I, I showed you results, how we approached it. And we measured evaporation rates for all those systems I talked about before. But again, this is experimentally challenging. We will have to measure evaporation rates for every single like combination of sulfuric acid plus stuff in the atmosphere if we want to accurately model nucleation rates in a region. That is just kind of a nightmare. Um, if you don't want to run experiments, you could also use computational chemistry to help model, okay, these, what is this, five, five molecules here. You can model it in computational chemistry. You can minimize the free energy. You could calculate the energy um, of the binding energy in the cluster, and you can calculate the evaporation rate. You can do that. Um, it is computationally uh, challenging to do that for hundreds and hundreds of different types of uh, combination of molecules that can form these clusters. So it's the same problem in both spaces. You either have to go and experimentally measure in the lab every reaction, or you use computational chemistry and model every single reaction that occurred. And as you saw before, the list of compounds is really, really kind of exploding. So every time a new paper comes out saying, hey, we found a new molecule that can nucleate, there should be like a collective groan, like, oh, how are we going to get this into a model? And so my group has developed something that we're calling the nucleation potential model. And this was kind of based on what we saw happening in the lab. This is what we saw from our, our um, acid-based chemical reactions. We know generally how particles are forming. We know the chemical mechanism most of these reactions are taking. And because we know that, and computational chemistry is, is confirming that, we could actually kind of simplify all of these different compounds in the complex mixture and all the crazy reactions into just one straightforward reaction. And so we take all of those reactions and we boil it down to something really easy. And it's going to look like the kinetic model, but there's one important difference. So we start with our monomer. And the monomer could be a sulfuric acid molecule. It could be a sulfuric acid molecule plus some stabilizing compound, but it has just one sulfuric acid. And we're going to say the monomer is formed from sulfuric acid bumping into the stabilizing compound or an effective base. And it's going to form a monomer or N1. And after that, N1 just grows through collision with another monomer to form a dimer. Dimer collides with a monomer to form a trimer. And two dimers colliding can form a tetramer, or a trimer plus a monomer can form a tetramer. So basically, what we do in this model is we're only allowing clusters to form once they form this initial monomer step. And after that, it just grows through addition of a monomer. And so we don't actually care what's inside the monomer. Um, we're just assuming it's all going at the collision rate. It does not evaporate. And when you stop evaporation from happening in this model, it actually changes how much concentration of these precursor gases you have. And so what our model is doing is we will measure N4, which actually is the size of a one nanometer particle. Um, N4 is, yeah, four sulfurics plus a bunch of junk on it. It's about one nanometer in size. So we can measure this with the CPC or diethylene glycol CPC. And we have the concentration of sulfuric acid or the monomer. And so if we know N4 and we know A1 and we know how long it takes for this reaction to occur, we can actually back calculate what this effective base concentration is here. And so this effective base concentration 
captures how much um, how much stabilizing compound is in the atmosphere. And it's not just how much, but also captures generally the potency of these compounds in the atmosphere. And so it's going to be a little, it's not going to be quite intuitive. So I'm going to kind of like explain what um, the effective base concentration is. And so if I plot here on the x-axis, the experimental concentration of base, so the actual concentration of base floating around in the atmosphere, let's say ammonia, and on the y-axis, we plot the effective base concentration. So if it's a really, really, you know, really potent stabilizing compound, it's going to follow these orange dots here. So it won't take that much base to really nucleate and form a lot of one nanometer particles. We saw those that in the previous graphs. Small amounts of base really nucleates a lot of particles. And because it's nucleating a lot of particles, you expect there to be a higher effective base concentration. Because again, we're not talking about evaporation rates anymore. We're talking about, well, if something's super potent and you don't need a lot of it, it's, at, it's acting as if there's a high concentration of this compound floating around in the atmosphere, like higher collision rates and so on and so forth. If you have a very weak compound, let's say ammonia at nucleating uh, particles with sulfuric acid, you expect as you increase the ammonia concentration, you won't form that many particles. And when you don't form that many particles, you get a much, much lower effective base concentration. It just, it's acting as if there's not much ammonia in the system because it's not forming that many particles. So more potent or more epic the stabilizing compound is, a higher the effective base concentration. And the less epic, the less potent it is, the less um, the effective base concentration is. And this is, we're just talking about single component. We'll talk about next year in a second. And so here's some results from Jack Johnson's um, uh, study using this nucleation potential model. And we held the sulfuric acid concentration constant. It's actually pretty low for a reactor, 10 to the 8. But <clears throat> on the x-axis, we have the measured base concentration. So how much real base there is. Now on the y-axis, we have the effective base concentration. And the blue dots, we have our ammonia. And the red is dimethylamine. I screwed up the labels here. I'm sorry. Red, red here is methylamine. Please, please scratch that. Um, the black triangle should be dimethylamine, and the pentagons are actually trimethylamine. So these two top ones are dimethylamine and trimethylamine. And it goes in the same order that we saw before. Ammonia has a very, very low B effective. It's because it's not great at nucleating particles. So it's, it's as if it has a very low concentration in the atmosphere or effective concentration. Methylamine, these red circles are much better at forming particles. So it's a higher effective base concentration. And as we saw before, dimethylamine and trimethylamine are great at nucleating particles. So it's, it's, it's as if it has a very high effective base concentration. And what's really nice about our model is not so much what it can do with the single component mixtures, it's what it can do with the multiple component mixtures. And it's because it can handle these multiple components is we really think this model is um, really gonna help us out trying to capture what's happening in the actual uh, um, atmosphere. So here in the black triangles, we have dimethylamine. This was a single component, just like we saw. And if we mix dimethylamine with like, let's say 70 parts per trillion of ammonia, we get these blue um, diamonds. And that automatically tells us, remember, ammonia has a pretty low B effective. It actually is synergistically reacting with the DMA. We can see that in the B effective values. It has a much higher effective base concentration than we expected just by adding ammonia and DMA's effective base concentration. We can then put in ammonia and a little bit of methylamine, and you get these blue squares, these light blue squares. And it's a little bit higher than with ammonia. And then we can mix in a little trimethylamine, methylamine, and ammonia. We can do all four bases together. And we get this, these orange dots here. So an even higher B effective. And so what's really nice about this model is we actually don't, we aren't super concerned about how much ammonia or how much methylamine or how much trimethylamine or DMAs in, in the system. We actually care about just straight up what the B effective value is. It tells us, regardless of what the mixture is, it's expressing a really high B effective value which tells us that it has a lot of these dimethylamine-like or very potent-like molecules floating around. 
So we could take this complex system or this complex soup of reactions and really just boil it down to one number. And yeah, we lose some information in the process. We lose exactly the chemical mechanism um, and we lose all the, um, you know, the detailed reaction kinetics. What we gain is the ability to capture how nucleation rates are changing as the complex mixture is changing. So to summarize, and I'm not sure how long I've gone, I think about the right amount of time. The first bit of the, the talk is we were covering about, we were covering specific compounds. We knew sulfuric acid nuclease particles, and we wanted to know what helps sulfuric acid nuclease particles. And the specific results I showed, ammonia could definitely help, but not great. Methylamine is better. And then we get some alcohol amines in there. This is diethanolamine and monoethanolamine. And then we get, on the really, really great end, the very potent end, we get trimethylamine and dimethylamine, and then much better than those, we get the diamonds. These are just the results I showed. There are so many other compounds out there. Um, right now in the lab, we're looking at um, organic acids. We are looking at a mixture of other sulfur-based acids. We are looking at um, iodic acid. I mean, there are so many compounds out there that can interact with sulfuric acid and form particles. And so we developed this nucleation potential model to help us take all of those hundreds and hundreds of pathways of reactions and simplify it down to one. And this gives us a, an effective base concentration that tells us how, how potent is this mixture at enhancing sulfuric acid nucleation rates. And one aspect I didn't talk about here, and this is where a lot of the instrumentation development is coming from, is we actually don't need mass spectrometer to measure the potency of the uh, mixture anymore. We can quantify the effectiveness of the precursor gases based totally on um, one nanometer particle concentration measurements with the CPC. And this is really powerful. Um, for those of you who had to haul mass spectrometers around to like remote sites, um, if I told you you didn't have to do that, it would be nice to just haul around like a CPC. You'd probably be more willing to do that. And we're now using these one nanometer CPCs not just to measure be effective, but we can use these CPCs to actually measure sulfuric acid concentrations as well. So it's opening up this whole new realm for us of using a particle instrument to measure gas phase concentration. And again, didn't talk much about it in the presentation, but that's what we're working on right now. And so this is my group. I have so many students. <laughs> um, the work was primarily done by Sandra Fomente and Jack Johnson, who's um, right here front row and center. But I also have Farah, Deanna, Dom, and Darren. And Wendy uh, and Christine just joined our group. She's our first year. They could make this photo. Uh, this was in the summer when the pandemic wasn't so bad. Um, these are all PhD students. And then some of the earlier work was with uh, Pete McMurray and Dave Hansen. And this is, we're very jolly that day. Um, so yeah, everyone who's ever helped me, I thank them. My students are great, getting great results. And with that, I will take any questions. All right, thanks, Cody. That was an excellent presentation. Um, we've got some folks in the uh, meeting here who if they have questions, they should certainly feel uh, like they can ask them and we'll also um, switch over to Slido as needed for some of the online questions as well. Um, does anybody in the meeting room have any questions they can ask? at the moment. Sorry, just I saw Ali just logged in. <laughs> and this is summer. <clears throat> Cody, I have one question. It's John yeah. Orlando here. Hi. Hi. Thanks for a great talk. It seemed like in some of the early slides you showed with the amine enhancing um, nucleation, towards the high end, things sort of collapsed down a little bit. Is that artifacts of tough measurements or is there something happening there? Uh, let's see if I can pull that up super, uh, how did I? Yeah, I know what you're so like here, like it seems like if I look at this graph, dimethylamine, it like not only does it collapse down, but you get that like turning over effect. Right, right. Um, 
Yeah, there. This is totally. Uh, uh, this is more of a issue with the flow tube, and so we're operating our tube at extremely high sulfuric acid concentrations. So, like, I think the highest people have observed out in the atmosphere so for sulfuric acids, like ten to the eight. Um, we typically operate at high ten to the eight, ten to the nine, and now we're putting in a lot of amines, like two hundred parts per trillion or something. Um, Dimethylamine concentrations in the atmosphere on average are probably single digit or maybe tens of parts per trillion. The fact that we have high sulfuric and high amine concentrations means we're just forming a lot of particles. Um, and so the reason why these, these curves all collapse is the coagulation rate is super high. There's just so many particles being formed that it's, it's basically eating the dimers faster than they can, be, they can get formed. So that's that's totally a figment of the um, flow tube, and you get this like turning down effect, um, like up here. I don't wait. Can you uh, hold on? So this turning down, like it flattens out here. That's also for the same reason. You keep increasing sulfuric acid concentration, and you're forming higher and higher particle concentrations that will just keep scavenging um, your your small cluster concentrations. So, yeah. Makes perfect sense. Thank you. Yep. No problem. All right, some Slido questions um, from Anonymous. How does your framework work with global models? Don't you still need speciated precursors? So no matter what, you're gonna need sulfuric acid speciated precursor. You will still have to have that in global models. Um, the emission inventories for SO2 and generally the reactions for converting it over into sulfuric acid, they're not perfect, but they exist. Um, there are no, there's emission inventories for ammonia. There are, to my knowledge, there's not any for the amines, um, definitely not for the diamines. I mean, the inventories for those are quite bad. That's why I assume you're asking about speciated precursor emissions. Um, so that's why we want to go out and measure them. So how does the framework kind of simplify that? Um, we're actually seeing, and this is part of uh, something I didn't quite talk about, we're seeing B effective could be just more easily related to one or two compounds that are out there. And we actually are analyzing previous campaign data um, to look at how B effective varies from place to place. And shockingly, it seems to follow ammonia really well. So if we just had a B effective for that space, for that specific ammonia concentration, it seems to predict B effective correctly and then the nucleation rates correctly. And so this is surprising to us because we thought there'd be all this other junk out there um, helping enhance nucleation rates. But the B effective for ammonia for that spot seems to do a pretty good job. Um, so we're hoping we will just need a B effective for region um, instead of needing ammonia plus dimethylamine plus methylamine plus all these other speciated cursors. So we'll still need some precursor measurements. But it won't need nearly as many as what we what our current models are asking for, which is like everything. So again, this isn't supposed to replace um, mass spectrometry work. It's supposed to give us some other idea of what else is happening in addition to all these detailed chemical react uh, kinetic reactions. So hopefully that answers your question. If not, you can type in the link. All right, and one more. Anonymous question. Could you comment one more time on how the CPC could be an alternative to bringing a mass spectrometer into the field? I don't want to say alternative. I do love mass spectrometers, um, but I spent so much time with them. All they do is break. Um, it's weird because I remember when I worked with Dave Hansen, he would walk in the room and like the mass spectrometer would work. It like knew. But I don't want to say it's an alternative, but it is another option. And so our thinking and the way we're designing these CPCs is if we can, let's say we want to measure B effective, um, this like combined precursor concentration measurement. If we could react atmospheric air, and this is what we're doing now, we're reacting atmospheric air with a known concentration of sulfuric acid, let's say 10 to the eight number per cc, for a specific amount of time and count the number of particles, we can back calculate what B effective is. So we don't need a mass spectrometer if we already know the sulfuric acid concentration and already can measure the one nanometer particle concentration. And so we built this, um, and now we're trying to miniaturize it because it's ginormous right now, um, engineering problem. But the thought is you would just bring the CPC in this little reactor and you could go out and you could measure be effective without 
the mass spectrometer taking the detailed measurements. Um, and then what we're working on now is the flip side. Can we use the CPC to measure um, sulfuric acid concentration? And we, all of our initial results I didn't show, the answer is yes. It's just instead of injecting sulfuric acid into our little reactor, we're now injecting a base into our little reactor and then counting the number of particles and then back calculating the sulfuric acid concentration. So again, it's not a direct measurement of the gas phase concentration. By no means is it direct. Um, it's an indirect way of measuring it. But I don't know. The, the uncertainty we're seeing from our measurements is kind of on the order of the mass uh, concentrations calculated from the mass spectrometer. So that's a good thing. So hopefully that, that answers your question. Uh, we'll give it a few more moments. If anyone's got a question, go ahead and submit it to Slido. It'll take a little bit to get moderated. Um, if anyone else currently in the meeting room has any other questions, please feel free to just go ahead and ask them. Hey, Cody, this is Ale. I, I caught um last part of your talk it was uh really good uh i just wanted to ask you if you could comment about um temperature dependency um water content of the air parcels you'll be measuring in the field and um and what you've done in the lab and land versus sea situations yeah so um so your first part about temperature. So um, we're looking at temperature dependencies right now because actually we're trying to measure, we're trying to put these CPCs on uh, places that tend to be much colder than our lab. Our HVAC in our lab is broken. Um, so uh, be effective, well, we've, which isn't super surprising, be effective will go up at lower temperatures. Um, it's reducing evaporation rates um, in the full reaction mechanism scheme. And so because it's reducing evaporation rates, it's showing up as a higher be effective. You're forming more particles um, with the reactions we're looking at. Relative humidity also plays a huge role on this. We have not explored this mostly because it is not trivial changing relative humidity in our flow reactor and getting it to stay stable. Um, but we know relative humidity will play a role. I, I don't want to comment on how it will play a role until we start doing the measurements. It is also not obvious. It helps with some sulfuric acid amine reactions. I do not think it would, um, it might have lower impact on other like sulfuric acid, organic reaction, organic acid reactions, so on and so forth. So it, it's a not trivial, it's not a straightforward um, um, relationship there. So we're hoping to map that out um, as we're trying to get a changeable relative humidity uh, flow reactor online right now. And you also asked about water content in these particles, like how many water molecules are in them? Is that what you're asking? No, how, you know, what do you expect if, you know, looks like you have done stuff that is more concerning land uh, sources. What about yeah. um, sources from, from the sea? Yeah, so actually that's exactly what my student is working on right now. Um, it's really interesting. So the study is coming out from these really nice mass spectrometers being deployed to like the um, Southern Ocean or to the uh, Arctic Ocean. Um, we're seeing not just sulfuric acid hanging around, which is expected. We're also obviously seeing uh, MSA, uh, methane sulfonic acid, and also uh, they're seeing iodic acid. And so all of these can nucleate without each other, right? You can have MSA just forming its own particles, iodic acid just forming their particles. Um, so what my group is trying to look at is, well, if all three of them exist at the same time, how we expect the B effective to change? And the answer is actually, we can boil down, we can assume that like MSA and iodic acid are being combined into the B effective. It's acting like another stabilizing compound. It's helping the particle reach it to one nanometer in size. And so we're seeing some differences in be effective when we include more and more of these acids. And so I guess the short answer to your question, Ali, is we're looking into it. Um, there are there's still ammonia over oceans. We believe there's still amines happening from decomposition of just protein matter, but we don't know what concentrations. And to my knowledge, no one's really measured that. So we're we're building. Um, I have a grad student, Christine, who's building little uh, seaweed tanks right now um, to take these measurements because. 
I mean, we can't even guess what mixtures to try out in our flow tube until we take some more addition profile measurements of um, uh, kind of like the proteinaceous matter that could be floating around and decomposing and releasing these things. So we're looking at it and we are definitely looking at these uh, multi combination of um, acids because it's the chemical kinetics of sulfuric acid, MSA, and ionic acid are really interesting. Um, and mapping those out, my student, I think, is going crazy trying to map them out, um, which just goes to show how kind of infeasible it is sometimes. But it is something we're looking into just so we can get better B effective values for the marine environment. Good question. Should I answer the Slido question? Sure, it seems quite related, but yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I feel like there was some overlap. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely some overlap. I mean, so HOMS definitely impacts it. And um, basically anything that will stabilize and help form a one nanometer particle will show up in a higher B effective. And so what's great about our model is we aren't so concerned about what those compounds are. And that's not super satisfying. Um, in the end, we do want to know what compounds are actually helping form particles, because how do we come up with policy or how do we come up with like control measures to stop the formation of these particles if we don't actually know what's being formed? But until we get much more robust, reliable measurements of all these precursors, we can settle with be effective just so we can do a better job predicting nucleation rates based on kind of the, the, the potency of the general mixture of the atmosphere. So HOMS um, is something we have not put into our flow reactor, mostly because it's not like a compound we could just like buy from Sigma Aldrich and stick in. But we would expect it would also increase be effective. But we don't know to what extent it would increase it if you have other like ammonia or um, a means floating around as well. So that's something we, we would definitely be happy to test out um, once we figure out how to synthesize HOM in a clean way. Oops. Palms. I've got a, I've got a question. Yeah. Uh, hi, Cody. This is Brett Palm. Um, so uh, thanks for that nice talk. I was thinking about so when you add um, several compounds to a mixture, uh, it seems like it might be converging on sort of a higher be effective, and maybe you know at the atmospheric limit when you have a really complex mixture, it might not necessarily matter what the compounds are. Um, and so what are your thoughts on that? Like, can you eventually simplify the system in the atmosphere or are there still going to be sub compound, uh, subclasses of compounds that matter more? Yeah, let me, um, let me go back to screen share real quick. Let's see. Um, I, hold on. Uh, okay. So like this, so here in this, in this graph, we kind of dumped um, ammonium, methylamine, trimethylamine, and dimethylamine all together. And what you're, and what you correctly pointed out is it seems to like reach this kind of upper limit. And there's a couple of reasons it reaches that upper limit. And the first, first and foremost one is our sulfuric acid concentrations at about 10 to the eight. And we're actually limited, particle formation is not limited by the number of sulfuric acid molecules hanging around. We just can't form any more particles because there's just not enough sulfuric acid. There's just too much base floating around. And this is probably what's happening in the atmosphere. Um, there's typically a lot more ammonia, <laughs> definitely a lot more than 40 parts per trillion. There's usually like, you know, parts per billion level ammonia floating around. Um, but there's always like few parts per trillion of amines and plus a very high concentration of ammonia compared to the sulfuric acid concentration that's like 10 to the five, 10 to the six, they're almost always going to be sulfuric acid limited. And so we're going to operate in this regime where we might be not producing or seeing a, a major B effective change as you change the base concentration, as like the mixture changes, mostly because your sulfuric acid will just be stopping the sheer number of particles being limited. But the reason why we're so it seems like B effective depends on sulfuric acid concentration. But the way we're running our instrument, the CPC with the little reactor, is we actually set how much sulfuric acid we put in. Um, in this case, we're, we're going to set it at a pretty high concentration, like 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9. So it doesn't matter what sulfuric acid is in the atmosphere. We can still measure B effective. And from that B effective and the actual sulfuric acid concentration in the atmosphere, we can predict a nucleation rate. And so we're going to basically drive this reaction so it forms a ton of particles that we can count 
And that's not actually atmospherically relevant, but we're doing that so we can measure be effective. Does that answer kind of your question? Kind of. I know there was a second part to your question. And I forget it. I think so. Uh, so essentially the the you know where it's converging on this plot depends on how much sulfuric acid you have as well. Yeah. And yeah. we are, I mean, it's it's easy to so this is like this is our instrument. We are driving this reaction. It's different than in the atmosphere, which has obviously some be effective and a much, much lower sulfuric acid concentration. So obviously, if we know be effective and we measure the atmospheric A1 or sulfuric acid concentration, we can still predict one nanometer nucleation rates, but they will be different than obviously than how we rate our instrument because we are running in some artificial condition just to get the effective rate. Yeah, it, I think it'd be really cool to take this um, to go measure be effective in different locations. Obviously, we should start with Pittsburgh air because Pittsburgh air is disgusting. I'm sorry, I should, I should be more positive with Pittsburgh. It's kind of disgusting. Um, so we're, we're looking into that as we're trying to miniaturize this, this instrument to see how well be effect, how, basically how be effective changes like from night to day and how it changes seasonally as well. And once we understand that, then I think we'll have a be much better understanding of what specific compounds in the Pittsburgh air is driving the changes and be effective. And that, that's the information we're looking for. Hopefully, COVID really slowed things down. We're hoping to do that next year, but again, COVID. Great, thank you. Yep, thanks for the question. All right, I'm guessing we don't have any more questions from Slido, but maybe we should check just one last time. Um, okay, no more on Slido. Um, well, we are at 10 minutes past our normal a lot of time. So I think it's a good, it's a good time to, to close up. Thanks everyone for asking questions. Um, really appreciate the discussion we've had at the end and let's all join in thanking Cody again for giving us a great, great seminar. Thank you very much. Thanks Dick for having me here and Ollie for inviting me. <laughs>